In recent years, we've learned much more about the origin of life. Do you remember RNA, that nucleic acid that our cells use as messengers carrying the genetic information out of the cell nucleus? Well, it's been found that RNA, like protein, can control chemical reactions, as well as reproduce itself, which proteins can't do. Many scientists are now wondering if the first life on Earth was an RNA molecule. And it now seems feasible that key molecular building blocks for the origin of life fell out of the skies four billion years ago. Comets have now been found to have a lot of organic molecules in them. And they fell in huge numbers on the primitive Earth. We also mentioned the extinction of the dinosaurs and most of the other species of life on Earth about 65 million years ago. We now know that a large comet hit the Earth at just that time. The dust pall from that collision must have cooled and darkened the Earth, perhaps killing all the dinosaurs, but sparing the small furry mammals who were our ancestors. Other cometary mass extinctions in other epochs seem likely. If true, this would mean that comets have been the bringers both of life and death. In the history of the solar system, have worlds ever been destroyed? Most of the moons in the outer solar system have craters on them made by cometary impacts. Some have such large craters, though, that if the impacting comets had been just a little bit bigger, the moons would have been shattered. What would the results of such a collision look like? Maybe a planetary ring. The idea has been growing that little worlds are every now and then demolished by a cometary impact. The fragments then slowly coalesce and a moon arises again from its own ashes. Some moons may have been destroyed and reconstituted many times. For our own world, the peril is more subtle. Since this series was first broadcast, the dangers of the increasing greenhouse effect have become much more clear. We burn fossil fuels like uh, coal and gas and petroleum, putting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and thereby heating the Earth. The hellish conditions on Venus are a reminder that this is serious business. Computer models that successfully explain the climates of other planets predict the deaths of forests, parched croplands, the flooding of coastal cities, environmental refugees, widespread disasters in the next century unless we change our ways what do we have to do four things one much more efficient use of fossil fuels uh, why not cars that get 70 miles a gallon instead of 25 two research and development on safe alternative energy sources especially solar power three reforestation on a grand scale and four helping to bring the billion poorest people on the planet to self-sufficiency, which is the key step in curbing world population growth. Every one of these steps makes sense apart from greenhouse warming. Now, no one has proposed that the trouble with Venus is that there once was uh, Venusians who drove fuel-inefficient cars, but our nearest neighbor, nevertheless, is a stark warning on the possible fate of an Earth-like world. Mars today is strictly relevant to the global environment of the Earth. Its antiseptic surface is a cautionary tale of what happens if you don't have an ozone layer. Its great dust storms and the resulting cooling of its surface played a role in the discovery of nuclear winter, the catastrophic climate change on Earth predicted to follow nuclear war. So if you didn't have an ounce of adventuresome spirit in you, it would still make sense to support the exploration of Mars. In recent years, there's been a uh, groundswell of interest in organizing the first expedition of humans to go to the planet Mars. We first need more robotic missions, including rovers, balloons, and return sample missions, and more experience in long-duration spaceflight. 
But eventually, if all goes well, the interplanetary ship or ships would be constructed in Earth orbit, launched on the long journey to Mars, and then a landing module would set down on the surface. The crew would emerge, making the first human footfalls on another planet. It would be very expensive, of course, although cheaper if many nations share the cost. The key issue in my mind is whether the unmet needs down here on Earth should take priority. But that's a question even more appropriately addressed to the military budgets. Now, one trillion dollars a year worldwide. You can buy a lot for that. Justifications for the Mars endeavor have been offered in terms of scientific exploration, developing technology, international cooperation, education, the environment. Some see it as the obvious response to the future calling. Some even think we should go to investigate enigmatic landforms, including one that resembles an enormous human face. Personally, I think this, like uh, hundreds of other blocky mesas there, is sculpted by the high-speed winds, but if we're going anyway, there's no harm in taking a look. A remarkably diverse group of American leaders has endorsed the Mars goal. I imagine the emissaries from Earth, citizens of many nations, wandering down an ancient river valley on Mars, trying to understand how a quite Earth-like world was converted into a permanent ice age and looking for signs of ancient life along the river banks. In the long run, the significance of such a mission is nothing less than the conversion of humanity into a multi-planet species. Since Cosmos was first shown, Voyager spacecraft have explored the systems of the planets Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and have now passed the outermost planets on their way to the stars. We inserted the flavor of those encounters in our captain's log, but with image processing, we've been able to reconstruct astonishing movies of some of these worlds. Here, for example, is Jupiter, with its great red spot. And volcanic Io spinning before us. Icy Enceladus, a tiny moon of Saturn on much of which somehow the craters have melted. And Miranda of Uranus. Austere blue Neptune. Or consider Titan, the giant moon of Saturn, We've taken the nitrogen and methane in its atmosphere, irradiated it in the lab with electrons of the sort that are beamed at Titan from Saturn's magnetic field, and we make this stuff, which matches almost perfectly the observed properties of the Titan haze. What is it? It's a mixture of complex organic molecules. You drop some of the stuff into water, and among other things, you make amino acids, the building blocks of proteins. So. The starting materials of life are raining from the skies of Titan, like manna from heaven. I can't wait until the Cassini mission sends an entry probe through the organic haze of Titan to its enigmatic surface. The Voyager spacecraft rush on past the planets and to the stars, still returning data. As it left the planetary part of the solar system, Voyager 1 turned back to take one last portrait of the planets of the solar system. And one of those pictures was of the Earth, a tiny blue dot set in a sunbeam. Here it is. That's where we live. That's home. We humans are one species, and this is our world. It is our responsibility to cherish it. Of all the worlds in our solar system, the only one, so far as we know, graced by life. In our motorbike sequence, we showed how the landscape might look if we were barreling through it at close to the speed of light. Since then, inspired by this sequence, 
Ping Kang Seung at Carnegie Mellon University produced an exact computer animation. This is what you'd see if you were traveling at ordinary speeds through this red and white lattice. But this is how it would appear if you were traveling the same route at close to the speed of light. We're probably many centuries away from traveling close to the speed of light and experiencing time dilation. But even then, it might not be fast enough if we wanted to travel to some distant place in the galaxy, say, and then come back to Earth in our own epoch. Some years after completing Cosmos, I uh, found myself taking time out from my scientific work to write a novel, uh, a novel about travel to the center of the Milky Way galaxy. I was willing to imagine beings and civilizations uh, far more advanced than we, but I wasn't willing to ignore the laws of physics. Was there, even in principle, a way to get very quickly to uh, 30,000 light years from Earth? So I put this question to my friend Kip Thorne of the California Institute of Technology. He's a leading expert on the nature of space and time. Kip thought about it for a while and then uh, answered with about 50 lines of equations, which showed that a really advanced civilization might establish and hold open wormholes, which uh, we might think of as tubes through the fourth dimension, which connect the Earth with another place in the universe without having to traverse the intervening distance, something like crawling through a wormhole in an apple. I was very happy with this result, and I used it as a key plot device in, in contact. But such wormholes through space would also be time machines, it seemed to me. And I used that notion in, in my novel Contact as well. Kip Thorne and his colleagues later proved, or so it seemed, that time travel of this sort was possible. Here, look at this. The key question being explored now is whether such time travel can be done consistently with causes preceding effects, say, rather than following them. Does nature contrive it so that even with a time machine, you can intervene to prevent your own conception, for example? Even if time travel of this sort is really possible, it's far in our technological future. But maybe other beings, much more advanced than we, are voyaging to the far future in the remote past not a measly 40 years ago on Earth, but to witness the death of the sun, say, or the origin of the cosmos.